It is June um, 4th, 2014. Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Um, tonight's show started with uh, getting in my email a few weeks ago a uh, case study uh, that uh, Christine Chow and Nate Otto uh, put together, um, created, uh, did some research, and uh, I, Nate said uh, Christine did a lot of the work on it. You guys can clarify all that in a second. And I said, uh, Nate, you know what? I want to continue that conversation uh, we started, if, if, I don't know, a month then or, or two ago, talking about badges, but talking about it in um, kind of, I don't know how to say this, but uh, people who have already been working with badges, people who have some experience, people with some questions and issues and challenges and, and so forth, if, if that's fair to say. And it seemed to fit what Nate was thinking, that he'd like to have some... Well, Nate, I'll let you say it yourself. So we're going to talk about establishing the value of badges for earners. We have a couple of people um, representing um, people from the study as well. Do you want to um, do a better introduction, Nate, than I just did there? <laughs> just I'll do my best. Uh, yeah, good. Um, anyways, I'm Nate Otto. I'm from the... Design Principles Documentation Project at Indiana Thanks. University. We're led by uh, Professor Daniel Hickey in Learning Sciences, and um, special thanks to the MacArthur Foundation for supporting our study. Uh, we are looking at 30 different badge projects, people who built with badges, and telling their stories about how they built their badge systems, how they started with design, how they initially implemented it, and then how they moved on to come to some kind of continuing state where practice is steadied out. And part of our research mm -hmm. involves really like digging into like what these stories were and, and what challenges people came across. And one particular challenge that we noticed cropping up across a bunch of different projects was that people, the designers of the systems would come up with these really nice badges that they thought were really valuable. They would tell the people that were going to earn them that these were very valuable badges and that they could do all cool sorts of cool things for them in the future, like help them get jobs or promotions. But it was unclear to a lot of the uh, potential earners really like exactly what the pathway was to, to realize those steps or to um, get those advantages. And this story came up a whole lot. And um, Christine and I sort of coalesced some of the quotations we had and particular cases in um, a document where we describe, you know, how this looked from the particular perspectives of three different systems, the Providence After School Alliance, the um, YALSA, the, uh, what is that, the Young Adult Library Services Association? Yeah. You'll get to that. Yeah, good. Um, and then also the projects that Stacy Cruz represented um, through the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And so I'm really excited, that, Paul, that you invited me to, here to sort of... Um, have a chat around uh, a challenge here, and I'm um, excited sort of to get into it. Sure, and, and just um, if people are tuning in or listening to this and wondering what are open badges, we're not going to answer that question tonight, fair enough? I mean, you'll get a good idea, but this is uh, the next stage. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> yeah, so if, if people want to find that out, where would you point them? Like there, there's a lot started. of resources at openbadges.org. Uh, a very brief example, an open badge is a digital image file that you can put on your website, and it is a token of an accomplishment or achievement that a badge issuer has awarded you. And you can use these badges, you put them on a digital resume, show them off to people. The important part is that there's metadata baked inside that can be verified back with that original issuer. So you can think of them kind of like the scouting badges that you might be familiar with, except that there's some internet connectivity there, and you can go back and, and make sure that the person showing it to you really did earn, earn it, and you can see what kind of evidence is attached, things like that. But there, there are some tricks to actually um, using them, and, and I'm sure we'll get into some of that. Cool. Gail Desler is joining us. Welcome, Gail. Um, but uh, Christine, why don't you introduce yourself as Gail books up here? Hi, I'm Christine, and I'm a consultant on digital educational media. I focus on the recognition aspect, along with the auto, on batch systems. And we are really uh, focusing on all the 
different aspects, the recognition assessment, motivation, and studying aspect of designing digital batch systems as is um, as Nate said, and I'm really excited to be here. Can you break that word down for us, Rec recognition assessment? Break it down, could you? Yeah, like, what do you mean by that? What is that you're really studying? Sure, what I study is more on recognizing learning. So for instance, the way that credentials recognize learning, okay. uh, formal credentials such as degrees, certificates, diplomas, or even informal credentials, and also just recognizing learners for their potential, for their achievements and skills. And in that sense, that would be recognizing the learning. Yeah, so um, we, we set a, out, defined a bunch of different general design principles for how badge systems can come together. And ba a badge system would be the combination of all the different practices to serve all of the different functions that the badge system needs to do. And one of those functions is in what recognizing learning. And the, the decisions a designer makes there are about, you know, what the particular badge means, you know, what claim that one image makes about a student's accomplishment. But then also things about, like, how which we'll get into today about like how those badges will move through um, an issuer's system, you know, like be published on their website, and how students are intended to sort of go in and access the value of the badge. Cool. Let's um let's finish introductions if we can. Um, Stacy, do you want to say hello? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you had warned me about open mic and a dog barking in the background. And oh, that's cool. We like dogs. We like dogs. It's so <laughs> I may, after I do my introductions, I may move to a, a more quiet space. Uh, I'm Stacy Cruz. I'm the director of Serious Games and Education at Pragmatic Solutions. We are a technology company, and our background and core competency is in reward recognition and assessment systems in online spaces. And so we have been experimenting with badges as a mechanism for doing that for several years before they were, we really entered this arena of badges for lifelong learning, but it was a really natural fit for us. And so in my capacity at Pragmatic Solutions, we really follow from inception through the implementation phase of interactive tools in K-20 education. And um, with the, the Haystack grants that were provided, we were able to work with a consortium in Philadelphia and we're several media producers through the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And that's the program that Nate referenced. Cool. And uh, Chris Shoemaker? Hey, I'm Chris Shoemaker. I'm the president-elect of YALSA, the Young Adult Library Services Association. And that's a division of the American Library Association. And we work with teen um, librarians, library workers, and advocates for libraries. Who are whose mission um, and goals are to strengthen library service for ages 12 to 18 year olds. Cool. And uh, your connection with badges a little bit. Um, I have been um, involved a little bit with the badge project for YALSA. I presented at the Haystack uh, conference in January of 2013. And I'm filling in for Nicole um, Mungia and Linda Braun, both of whom had engagements, and they asked me to, to step up. <laughs> That's very cool. Welcome. And Gail, can you say hello? Nice to see you. I, <laughs> thanks, Paul. Yeah, yeah and um, Stacy, I, I had my mic muted. Otherwise, you would have heard my dog was responding you can, to your talk. Yeah. So <laughs> that, that may happen uh, throughout the uh, hour or two. But... Yeah, so I'm Gail Dessler, and I work for the Elk Grove School District, which is in the South Sacramento area in California. And so, you know, I've been intrigued for a long time with badges. You know, have earned a couple myself. Um, I co-curate a, a digital citizenship project with another national writing project colleague, Natalie Bernasconi, and we've been talking about getting a badges system going. You know, that that um, through our digital ID project too. So, I'm also a Google certified teacher, and somebody recently posted in their listserv kind of an amazing system for rolling out badges. So, um, I'm going to say I'm really going to be a listener in this conversation, and probably not much of a contributor. I have a lot to learn, but I'm very interested in the topic. Speak up as much as you'd like. It's cool. Welcome. Um, so. 
uh, where do we go next here? I, you know, I, I do want to refer specifically back to Barry Joseph's uh, comments um, a while ago, again, a couple of months ago, saying, you know, we really need to have real conversations about how badges are really working in the real world kind of thing. Um, and um, and I think that's what we're doing tonight. Uh, so do you, do you want to um, describe some specifics about your case study here and see where it goes next, or what were you thinking? Does that sound right? Either Christine or Nate, jump in here. Sure, I can jump in real quick and just sort of get us started. Um, so, you know, as I was sort of getting into in the introduction, badges are kind of a new technology for recognizing learning and to be used as a credential for accessing future value. And a lot of the times, the programs that we were studying and other badge initiatives are approaching students who might not even have experience like crafting resumes and um, figuring out how to represent their accomplishments in you know traditional formats or what we would think was traditional that would be even new to them. And badges are a whole new layer on top of that where they have to figure out how, how to work with this technology and then how to use it to mediate um, you know their claims and and you know make make a claim about your qualifications in a context where it makes sense and that's that's a heavy lift for a um, you know maybe a high school or something like that and um, I heard some just really powerful stories among our projects um, that we studied just sort of about how hard it was to have conversations with students to get them sort of over that kind of barrier now so I'm wondering you know we have Stacy and Chris here if they have any stories, you know, from the badge systems that they're involved in that they'd like to sort of lead us off with? I would uh, echo your comments on being able to educate people, uh, educate. That's one of the biggest pieces that we got. Um, member feedback on when we were introducing our badges, which are focused on YALSA's professional competencies and, and really being able to outline uh, standards of service. We so Chris, I just want to clarify, so these badges are for librarians? Yes, so. these are for librarians um, okay. as, as a piece of professional development. Mm -hmm. And because of the nature of our the feedback system we designed, um, the the badge earner submits artifacts and work which are then evaluated by peers and the badge is awarded that way and there's a lot of discussion and, and feedback about the fact that it was going to be a peer based system and mem our members had a lot of questions about who would be who these sort of peers would be and, and how that would participate or how they how they would be able to receive that feedback and grow. And so just even from the start, being able to, to communicate the value of having peer um, evaluation and analysis to, analysis to really strengthen the fact that it did demonstrate the knowledge and the competencies gained from it. Hey, can you describe one of the competencies? That uh, have, yeah, we have... Um, we have seven different areas uh, of focus, um, marketing, outreach, communication. Uh, obviously, with librarians, there's a focus on the knowledge of materials, so collections and, uh, and books and program ideas. Uh, and then also administration, the sort of upper level functions and um, working within advocacy and, and areas like that. Yeah, and Chris, uh, one of the things when I started investigating this system, I noticed that a lot of these competencies are not things that are specifically taught even at like the library school, you know, master's degree level, and and so this badge system really focuses learning that happens on the job. Right. We um, between the the competencies and then Yalsa's brand new futures report, which it, which sets a new vision for teen services in libraries uh, for the twenty first century. Um, we see a major disconnect between what's happening in schools and what skills people need on the front lines and in order to best serve their communities. So the 
the, the mutable nature of badges means that we will be able to incorporate those shifts and those changes m more rapidly than schools having to redesign their curriculum. So it's a nice way to balance the hard skills and the soft skills uh, in, in the name of professional development. I, I always, I, sorry, but I always want to leap in when I hear that distinction, though, because the, th the seven things you listed there f sounded pretty hard to me, you know? I mean, they weren't, they weren't, you know, how do you feel about young people? <laughs> you know, they were administration. They were, but, so right. what, what do you mean by that distinction, I guess, is well, it? Outreach and less biased way to ask. <laughs> yeah. No, that's fine. Um, in outreach and communication, um, those tend to be about partnerships and and personal connections and and connections with your audience and um, things that are uh, that are obviously less tangible and um, that depend more on personality and and sort of those those personal interaction levels that people are able to bring and perform, whereas, you know, knowledge of materials is, is easy and it's book lists and cataloging uh, and, and those sorts of pieces. So, you know, the, the ability for us to encourage the, the librarian as a person and as a member of a community rather than just the institution um, is, is important to us in our badges. So I can right. keep, uh, go ahead, Christine. Yeah, please. <laughs> sure, and an interesting that Nicole Mungia mentioned and brought up last time was how badges were able to tell the narrative of the librarians, of their continual on-the-job learning, updating of skill sets, and so really the badge becomes a part of that personal narrative in that sense. And telling the story of who they are and their work experiences and also offering the, them the opportunity to be a part of that community and have that strong support network to enable them to move forward and advance beyond um, one can imagine. Can I ask a, a, a back to the researchers here again because you guys have looked at um, lots of programs but it was interesting what Chris just said about that the, it seems like the badges that uh, you also were created where there was what you called a major disconnect between you know traditional training and the real skills that people need um, and and I'm wondering is if somebody's wanting to start a badging system and when they do is that where people look do they look where is where are there <laughs> it would seem to me that it's a good place to look, like looking for disconnects between what's what skills really are needed and what you know in schools, the disconnect between tests and and skills kids need after school, is part of what I think it's about. Yeah, well, so I think I see sort of two different main approaches that um, systems took, and that would be one of them is is looking to recognize some kind of learning or achievement that had previously not, you know, gone unrecognized in um, the program. And then the other approach would be just to duplicate the existing, um, uh, you know, credentials with um, digital badges. And we see some of that as well. And um, in uh, Providence After School Alliance PASA's program, they started out with a program that just duplicated the existing credentials, basically. They were just for completion of 10-week after-school programs. And they found that that wasn't, I mean, part of, they, they came across this challenge of demonstrating the value of the credentials to students, specifically because they had chosen to duplicate, you know, uh, something that they already were recognizing in a different way and actually providing school credit for. Um, the students didn't see what the advantage of having a badge was, and um, they had no idea what to do with them. Whereas um, Yelsa's approach of choosing um, skills that students don't have um, recognized tokens of in their, you know, their degree as what the, you know, that, that's the recognition that decision they made around like what claim they wanted to make with the badge. So can you um, identify then the challenge that you also found? Well, okay, so Chris, I, you know, I was just going to ask you, um, 
like what could you detail sort of what sort of circumstances um, your librarians and library workers would go and present these badges to people? And um, have you heard any sort of feedback about like whether people are you know, successfully like using them as part of uh, a self improvement process? Um, yes, we um, we launched the system in in twenty in December of twenty thirteen. So not that long ago, but not that um, uh, not that recently. And so um, I know we had a, a crowd of enthusiastic beta testers who wanted to get involved. And our, our idea was, um, was very similar to, uh, to what Christine had, had been talking about, the idea that they would be part of that, uh, that sort of personal narratives. Librarianship is often a second career, uh, or for students who are just coming out of library school who don't have the, the ba uh, a background in public libraries, our goal was really to have the badges to be something that could be communicated on a resume to an employer, um, and and be able to share out those those skills. Because for myself as an administrator, when I hire a librarian, I don't look to see that they had done a cataloging class. I'm more interested in what their personal skills are like working on a reference desk and how they have have designed programs and evaluated them and all all those other Factors that don't always that don't factor in, especially for a recent graduate. Um, and so our our big thought was that resumes would be the main destination for the badges, but then also for librarians to really be able to answer the question why. Um, you know, why are their roles important? Why are they? Why are why librarian positions are important in schools and in in public libraries across the country. So giving them an advocacy tool during tight budget times or when it comes time to try and um, increase staff sizes and things like that. Yeah, I mean, th those are like really good situations to use a badge. Um, I, I think that people may still like, actually, I mean, you can't actually put a digital badge on, on the paper resume that you turn into someone or, or even a PDF that you, you email when you're applying for a job. Um, have you done any work to like actually like show people like how to use the backpack and um, you know where to, to send a link to somebody? I know that um, the backpack is is part of the system. I haven't been inside of it recently enough to to know how it work how that piece is, is functioning right now. But I know um, that the goal is to make it as easily shared and and pushed out as possible. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, Stacy, do you want to jump in? And um, I, I know you have some really good stories from uh, your various projects about specifically this challenge, which is some of the stuff that really motivated us to write about this as a particular topic. Sure, and and things just keep on evolving. I I will say proudly that we have tried lots of strategies, many of which were unsuccessful, and we keep on we keep on hammering it away. We were very, very lucky, very fortunate, particularly in our work with uh, PBS NewsHour and their educational program, which is PBS Student Reporting Labs, and our grant with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Lucky, lucky not only in that they had a very dedicated community and a very robust curriculum, but also in that part of their continued funding outside of our original grant was to hire a researcher, an external evaluator, to look at the work that we were doing and to survey the teachers and the students that were participating in the badge platform that we had built for them. So we got very good third-party data, and we actually embedded his research instrument into the registration process. And we got that preliminary data back about four months ago, and we found some very interesting things. What we found is that there was uniformly enthusiasm about the idea of a badge. A very friendly word, people have a usually have some kind of a conception of a badge as some kind of a recognition tool. And that's a good way to, to open a conversation. So they were intrigued and they were interested. We learned that the platform that we built for them wasn't too tough and it wasn't too easy. They reported it as being, you know, it's like the porridge right in the middle. It was just about right. And so we felt like, okay, so we got that right. The technology system was calibrated appropriately for the audience that we were working with. 
So then our next question was, why didn't they use it more? If they were excited about the badges, and if they were able to access the system, if we combated any initial problems that we found, and we did a pretty deep dive into what we could expect in the technology environment and aptitude at the schools we were working with, which tend to be Title I schools. That's, that's the area that that particular program targets. What, if we got all that you, right, then why did we get about 25% usage across our student base? I'm sorry, what was your question? I, I was wondering what... what um, are these high schools, middle schools, colleges? Both. Both. High school and mostly high school, also middle school, some after school programs that span the grade 5 through 11th grade age span. No colleges or junior colleges for this particular program. We've worked okay. with them in badges in other areas, and we've actually found the questions that come up to be exactly the same, which is fascinating. So, so that was our big question, is if we got the technology right, and if the initial engagement, if we piqued their interest, why did we only get about 25% uptake on schools actually issuing badges? Because that's what the numbers show. And what we found is absolutely reflective of the topic of this conversation tonight, and that's they didn't see the value. And it's what Nate was just saying, too. Now, the badges that were issued, were they were cumulative, and they reflected proficiency levels. So we felt like we got that right. There were some simple badges to earn, they were all reflective of either discrete tasks or processes. They were all collaborative. That's the way the curriculum works. So kind of if you had to go through and tick off all of the things that you might want to try to accomplish in a, a project-based or a challenge-based curriculum, I could make the case that's very much what the, the PBS, Student Reporting Labs curriculum is. Again, then why wasn't that, that value? What so did we get wrong? Stacy, can I interrupt you again and say, in the sentence, they didn't see the value, who's the they? <laughs> The teachers? teachers? Both, okay. Yeah. Both. Both. Uh, oh, and, and I should also note that a key part of that program is that every school is connected to a local PBS mentor who is an individual that actually works at a local PBS station. So we thought, okay, that's great. We're bringing that workforce pipeline into that internship pipeline in. Now, why didn't we get more of them to log in if they were excited at the beginning as well? And what we realized is that the value had to come from what someone was able to achieve or earn or, or, or get obtained in having that badge that they wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. And that was really key. So we were explaining these badges as being a mechanism to improve your educational possibilities, to um, open up this world of internships, open up the dialogue with your PBS station, that that's why you should want to earn these badges. And the students were, I will say, much savvier than we expected them to be. And their question was, that's fantastic. What jobs, where, when? And we didn't so, have that. Can I, can I uh, just again, I'm listening, I'm trying to, so open up the world of internships. So you're imagining I do a project around the PBS curriculum, I get badges for that, then I can go to a local station and say, you know, I've earned these badges, do you have an internship that would fit? Is that the model that you're imagining? Yes, yes. Yeah. we thought okay. that that was one of the possibilities uh -huh. because yeah. these badges were going to link back, as, as many people's badges do, as a sort of mini portfolio where the student's work product was actually going to be linked as part of the badge. So something that sits outside of their regular school transcript, something reflective of these actual job skills that they've obtained. So we thought we had all the notes right kind of in that story. But what we found is that there was a key, there were a couple of key components that were missing. And the way that we've distilled that down really was to go back to our own experience with reward systems in video games, where of course they've been happening for years. And what we realized, and, and this, is, this is not our original thought, this has been documented and researched pretty liberally, is that any reward or recognition system has got to have one of three things. Probably the best reward systems have all three. The first component is it has to either confirm or expand my sense of identity. So either I have this perception of myself or this perception of what I want to be and you're rewarding me for that. Um, I want to be a mayor in Foursquare. I, I want to have a leadership position in Foursquare and you're helping me confirm that sense of myself that I want to build toward. It's also why recognition systems and things like Amazon work really well. I, I see the recommendation, you know, you might like these that Amazon gives me and there's this instant emotional response of, oh, they know me so well. They know me. That's what drives purchases. This is not novel. This is this is marketing. 
Yeah. Um, As our project defined um, general principles for motivating participation in learning, we did find that the principle that she was, would be talking about here, which was recognize identities, was one of the most powerful um, motivational principles that um, a lot of different projects used and reported. And we did indeed split it into two different um, subcategories that line up with exactly what um, Stacy's talking about there, where one um, recognizes an identity that a student already feels they have, and another one allows students to explore identities that they would like to take on. Uh, that any, is a much more scientific quick, way to explain it. But yeah, that's what we no, found. Any, any quick examples of those identities? Um, oh, sure. Well, for our, in, in our example, there was, by design, no way, there was no leveling up in the system that we designed for NewsHour. That's not the way the system worked. It wasn't the way that the producers wanted to, to structure the system. And so when, where you entered the system was really where you exited the system. You might have achieved more badges, but it in no way helped you build toward your sense of self within the program. Like, I see myself as a writer. I see myself as a camera operator. Or I want to be that kind of person. We didn't really build those trajectories or those learning pathways within the system because we didn't realize how important they might be to the students. So everyone was very equal. And we thought that that was the right choice for the population of students that we were working with. Underserved, underprivileged, frequently in inner city schools, we didn't want to, to create any kind of levels or potential perceived disparities um, in individual groups of students or across groups. So we really kind of kept it a neutral environment. Turned out that did not work well we would have been much better off in helping them both conf confirm how they saw their role within the program and help them define what they wanted to learn toward or build toward, which I think Yalsa was on the, is on the track of, of doing that. We didn't think, we didn't realize how important it was going to be with these middle school and high school students. Let's check in with Chris. Chris, is this echoing anything or making you think of anything with your program? Um, if not, that's okay. I just... <laughs> No, I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm just thinking about the the leveling up, and I mean, we we had initially envisioned a much more complex system with um, uh, with with pie badges and and pieces, and what we ended up having to do, at least for this round, and we'll see what we can develop next, is an expert badge that that is sort of the you know the the peak of the the badge pyramid. It reflects. It reflects the learning, but um, isn't necessarily the next step. It's sort of more of the capstone in our model. So, Stacy, go ahead. You were breaking down three motivations. Oh, sure. Uh, the next one is social currency. Mm -hmm. So, any reward system has to both confirm who I am and earn and help me earn stature within whatever community I place myself within. Mm -hmm. And so that's why video, that's why badges work well on Xbox Live. It's why they work well um, in something like Farmville. I'm recognized for the things I can do and the things I have, even within my own community, by this these visual representations of skills and proficiencies. What but we those are, are working but those are pretty pretty tight communities, right? I mean, pretty well defined communities. Those are well defined communities, and what we realized with student reporting labs is that we were defining the community as as the program as student reporting labs. What we realized is that for these students, their social currency was really in and around their school space, and we weren't helping them build that. We weren't helping them grow social currency in the location where they spent the most time, which was school, and not necessarily in student reporting labs. So the question became, was there a way, is there a way that earning those badges might help them earn stature and reward in this larger community in which they define and situate themselves? And so we're exploring that actually for this next program year. What we realized would be, and this was for the teachers too, this was a very big deal for the teachers. They said, the students are earning badges, that's great, when do I get my badge and what will it earn me? Because yeah, I mean, I mean, the joke around all this is, the is like uh, to ask students, "Do you want to put your badges up on your Facebook page?" Right? I mean, they if they don't use Facebook, oh well, um, they tweet, and for okay, so many of these students that Facebook. we were working with, um, these are students that do not have internet access at home. Um, okay, in fact, roughly twenty-five percent of them don't. So the question is, what could we give them? And we had these teachers coming back to us and saying, "I need a certificate. I need a certificate that has the badge on it." 
And here we were saying, but this is all about moving toward a digital space, digital learning, connectedness in online environments. We want to teach them that digital literacy. We want to give them the, that self-efficacy. And these teachers uniformly came back to us and said, that is a wonderful goal, but that's not where my children are right now. So can you meet them where they are? So together we can build them to where we want them to be. And where so, they are right now is give me a paper certificate because I can show that to the principal. I hope you don't mind my keeping and interrupting you. Of course not. <laughs> Let me go back to the researchers for a second. So social currency, is that an issue you guys have found in other systems too? Or how does that? Well, you know, I think it plays out differently in a lot of different contexts. So we have, um, you know, a lot of projects that are located in, like, after-school programs and uh, where a student might consider their social group, you know, it, it may be, as Stacy said, that the it's not just the people who are taking the program with them, it's their actual friends, and the badge that they earned for that may or may not be valuable. Um, I don't think I s can recall any projects that really might... tried to... Oh, go ahead, Christine. Sure, I'm just going to jump in here. For PAUSA, they also face some structural issues, and there is definitely some challenges that they encountered in, in terms of building that currency of the badge. However, they, there was this sense of the students recognizing the value of having socially meaningful experiences with the adults. So getting to work with cool adults on something that they're interested in uh, through these 10-week programs, that was something that they're interested in and that have value for them. However, a lot of times there is this disconnect between the value of the badges and opening up these concrete pathways for them to have those opportunities to get them that job, to get them that um, college acceptance, as opposed to um, just, you know, showing them, uh, well, there's this badge, now um, this is relevant to you, and not having them be able to see that immediate relevance right away. Yeah, I'm not sure I know of any projects that did a really good job of forming badges that were very useful in, like, you know, building social connections with the people they already considered, you know, friends and part of their social networks. But as Christine said, that PASA one, where uh, the programs themselves um, had a lot of value in uh, just letting the students interact with the program providers who they really respected. But is, is, isn't this impossible, though? I mean, it feels so individualized. Like everybody's, um, you know, social community where there might be currency, how would you predict that ahead of time and be able to plan for it? Yeah, you know, I don't know. Um, because mm -hmm. one of the things that badges might do, is it helps you build yourself into affinity groups that are not, like, your particular friends. And we do a lot of research, uh, you know, sort of in concert with the Connected Learning folks, the movement led by Mimi Ito. And a, a lot of the times when students, they'll have one group of friends that they hang out with and they'll joke around about certain topics and, and see what each other are interested in. But then when they want to really go, uh, as, as Mimi Ito says, geek out about something, they'll go and sort of find a different community, you know, like a maker space or an online forum or or, you know, go write fanfic about, you know, their favorite book. And they'll really get into that particular community. And a badge that's targeted around interests um, might be a better fit for that kind of community. And it's, it's, you know, that's one of the design decisions you have to make when you're thinking about what um, claims you're going to make with a badge and how to sort of package it is, you know, what communities would value it. No, oh, that's big, but, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to hit the third point, Stacey? Or is, uh, or? Sure. Any kind of reward or recognition system has to unlock future opportunity. And obviously these three things are very interrelated. And what we found in the badges that we were offering is we were telling people that they were going to help them achieve something that they wanted, the, the next level. The next level being an internship or a job opportunity. But we hadn't quantified that and we didn't have that pipeline prepared for them. And so what we were offering to them ended up this is the feedback that we got back, feeling like an empty promise. Because we were just another organization, just another tool asking them to do something without being able to really explain what the direct benefit back was going to be. And this is an underserved population. So this is a very, that's a very meaningful issue. And so all of these things in, in concert have made us completely redo the system that will launch for student reporting labs for this next academic year. 
They're being so very you brave. you figured it all out? Come on. What's that? <laughs> you figured it all out? <laughs> I don't know that, no. I don't Jesus. think there's ever a figuring yeah. it all out. But I do think yeah. that we were, we were really lucky this year to have that research data. And we were really fortunate to have veteran teachers and novice teachers that really do want to get it right. And they're working with very struggling, with students that struggle. And so there's a lot of passion in that community. And I don't think you get that all the time. So we were very lucky. We had very honest teachers saying, this is what I like, this is what I didn't like. I don't know why you guys did this. You were crazy. I don't know why you thought we were going to spend that time. And that's enormously helpful. There was a real um, spirit of honesty within that program that was there before we got to the table. So we were lucky in that. So I don't think we figured it out, but I think we're on a really interesting new path. And, and I'll tell you what it is, because I think it's really exciting. And I don't think they'd mind if I, if I unveiled it in this conversation. So the way that we are redoing the system is extracting all of the task level badges that we had done and entirely orienting them toward workforce and job skills. So last year's system had 16 badges in it, and they were meant to be very, very community building building up toward very process and task and skill oriented badges like camera operator, all that's getting taken out. So now there will be three and only three levels of badges. The first level of badge anyone can achieve after they've completed one broadcast media piece. So after they've completed the curriculum, students can apply for the badge, the teacher has to endorse it or redirect it back to them. After they've achieved that badge, which the system will automatically confer, once they answer certain questions and reflect on the process, everyone gets that. The next tier of badges is job skills badges, the jobs that directly align to the things that you would go to a TV station and apply for a job for or an internship for. So producer, writer, camera operator, video editor. The students can, after achieving the first level of badge, apply for those badges. The teachers can either endorse them or redirect it back to the student. Once it gets endorsed, and notice the that they award it. Mm -hmm. Quick technical question. Redirect back. Um, I, I use P2P use system, and I totally understand how they do that. Um, but so redirect back means here are the three things you got to do to actually achieve this. It's not quite good enough. And then exactly. It, uh -huh, okay. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. once the teacher has endorsed it, that information is automatically going to be sent to NewsHour, where their producers there will make the choice to award the badge or send it back to the teacher. If the NewsHour people choose to award the badge, the next step is that the system will automatically contact the local PBS affiliate and tell them that there's a student ready who's achieved a who has achieved a workforce readiness badge that's been endorsed by PBS NewsHour. So we're Ready's really a nice word. Yeah, that goes. It's very yeah. nice. It and PBS has done. Um, they they've made sort of personal level effort to promote the uh, the students and you know provide opportunities for them where they see a student that really is doing great work and they you know reach out sort of on behalf of that student and you know help them sort of get to that next level of value and that I think that that might be sort of an important component of of you know helping students who haven't really wrangled a lot of badges before um, unlock what we call value. So, can, can, but can I identify, sorry, I just want to identify just because I don't want it to be missed. It seems that PBS, like, yes, everybody's working in concert, but from the kids' point of view, they're getting contacted from PBS, not from their teacher, which, right, I mean, and so it gives value to the badge there already in some way, right? Well, so. the, the program is curated and delivered by teachers at the local level. So the teachers are, mm -hmm. are heavily, heavily involved in the very beginning. But yes, to what you're saying, they're getting now a much more direct connection to PBS. Mm -hmm. Now the last two steps of the process, I mentioned there are going to be three tiers, is that if you've achieved the first level of badge, so that's the PBS NewsHour student reporter badge, if you've achieved a work readiness badge, any one of the ones that are available to you, you may then be nominated as a PBS All-Star, as a NewsHour All-Star. They're only selecting 11 students every year from across the country, and they're, they're starting it out this summer is the first time they'll do it. 11 students from across the country. That student gets an all-expense-paid trip to D.C. in August before the school year starts. They're setting up a meeting with their local congressional representative, and they'll get a chance to tour the NewsHour studios. So that's the culmination. So I feel like they really took to heart this idea of how do we help students level up and create this value within the system. And they're lucky in that they have the resources that they're able to do this, but I think it's a really nice model. The other thing that we're doing that the teachers are really excited about is that as soon as a student earns a workforce readiness badge, we are going to send a paper certificate to that student's um, school principal. That, we hope, expresses the value of the teacher and the work that they're doing 
because every school right now is focused on um, not just college readiness but workforce readiness. And so if demonstrating the value of this program is that a known brand and a trusted brand news hour is now endorsing the student and and by default endorsing the teacher's effort as well. We don't know how that's going to go, yeah. but the teachers well, are pretty excited about it and it'll be interesting to see. When it, when it happens, we'll have some students on and uh, hear what it sounds like. But um, so, thank you for those ama the, the amazing details. I want to see if we can pull the lens back a little bit though and have Christine and, uh, and um, I mean, may help us with that. Um, so, a lot of important issues were touched on there. Do you want to? And and what I again, I, I don't know why I'm focusing on this one, but part of what you identify in in your case study is um, that it's really hard for the student to go to an employer or or a place and and explain these badges to them, right? So it does seem to me like there needs to be somebody explaining to the employers, you know, I'm going to have a student come to you with these badges, and you know, like the, Nate, you've said before, there's too much burden on the on the learner to like learn the value themselves and then explain it to other people. Is that yeah, I mean, I think that that is how the ecosystem around badges is going to be for a while. Um, just like when you, you know, if you just have a paper resume, it is on, you know, it's on you to go and go to that employer and say that, okay, this is what I have and this is why it lines up with what you need. Um, when you add badges into that, there is another step of, and here are, this is what badges are, and this is, you know, this is, you have to add that whole layer of explaining, like, what it is that you're showing to them, because they probably won't understand it. Um, you know, people in the broader badge community are trying to do this sort of large level um, promotion of what badges are and spread awareness, and, you know, I think they're doing pretty well. I mean, we have, we're going to have a Clinton Global Initiative um, meeting in another two weeks, where some Mozilla people are going to be all involved. I don't know what the announcements that will come out of that are, but they will probably involve a renewed commitment to badges as connecting to workforce skills. And, you know, big organizations like that will sort of help promote the broad awareness of what badges are. But I think a lot of this, um, you know, the actual usefulness will be on the students. And then you have something like the student reporting labs where they go in and they, they do make that sort of introduction where you know, PBS is sending the notification to the local affiliate that that badge exists, this student has the skill, you know, and we're standing behind it, and the student doesn't have to go into that, you know, potential internship conversation just completely unarmed, or, you know, only with, with weapons that they don't know how to use very well. Right, and if I may add, part of the challenge of establishing the value of a badge to badge earners is also showing the value of the badge to employers, right? Because once the employers are able to see the value of a badge and what it can represent, then it could also translate into value for the learners themselves, for the badge earners themselves. And so then the question also turns to, well, what do the employers want to look at? What are the employers' needs? And so in that sense, it also is a little bit more um, interconnected for the challenge and it's, it's um, there are more complexities in addressing this challenge of establishing the value of a badge. Right, and as you know, Stacy's example about how she said that they're changing what claims the badges are make um, to be more of these workforce ready badges, where the claim of the badge is going to be more closely aligned with language that the employer knows and understands. Mm -hmm. That is something that an issuer, uh, a badge program lead, can do to, you know, to address this challenge, to try and, and make that translation gap a little bit smaller, I think. I, I wonder, though, <laughs> having messed with kind of different kinds of badges that way myself, um, that once you get those workforce badges, that's not the same thing as the identity badges, right? I mean, if I have a young woman who, and I'm, I'm thinking of somebody specifically who's whose identity is uh, getting positive images of women out into the media, right? <laughs> She's a junior in high school, and that's, that's her goal in life. So, you know, that, that's her identity, and that's how she wants to define her badge. You know, I'm, I'm just worried. I'm just, yeah. Can't, 
Again, I guess my question is, do we need different kinds of badges? or Like, are there identity badges and then workforce badges, or can they come together? I think that they absolutely can come together. It's really a design choice. It's a design choice, and it's knowing your constituency. Yeah, and I, as we have found out through our project where we we're identifying different principles in four different areas, all of the decisions about these different areas are very closely connected. So, um, and, and, you know, I don't think that a workforce badge is necessarily non-motivating from an identity uh, standpoint. Most of the projects that we, we apply that principle to are projects where the identity is like a particular, um, you know, employee, employment sort of style, like a journalist badge at um, Supporter to Reporter. They have um, badges for producer, journalist, um, and like mentor. And each of those are identities, and the badges are named for the role that students might see them in. And they are also awarded based on the skills developed you know, needed by those roles. So I think that's how um, identity can connect to badges that are, you know, very consumable by particular, you know, employers. Chris, can we yank you back in here? What have you been thinking? <laughs> um, oh, no, I'll jump in here too. Yeah. I was thinking of some of the discussions that we had and um, feedback that that we had been given from from Haystack when we presented on, on our draft and also in some of the other dis discussion pieces. And we, um, because of the focus that we had, we were really driven towards um, workforce badges. I, I mean... Well, you do, you do uh, have a pretty, pretty well-defined community that your badges are working in. Right. Our, our biggest issue is how do we make those workforce um, badges something that can really translate in a, across the identity issue because we in in libraries we have so many different um, job title silos and um, and classification silos and so our our goal is really to be able to um, use the, use these workforce skills to help break down that identity piece so that rather than uh, so that a, like an adult a librarian who works primarily with adults might really be interested in earning the YALSA materials badges because they do lots of readers advisory across different areas or because they're more interested in social media and the the badge that the skill set that they can um, can build through earning the, the communications badge is something they'd be able to apply multiple ways uh, and so really being able to shift shift libraries out of that age silo into a more um, more skill-based would be one of the pieces that we we would love to see develop across library communities because our other our other message is you know everybody in a library serves youth and these are skills that would be applied across all different areas um, Chris one of the so one of the uh, questions that I was thinking as you were talking earlier is that the narrative, my professional narrative, right? That that is wonderful. I'm just wondering how how do the badges help that narrative? Like, why couldn't they just do it without the badges? <laughs> um, well, for us, the 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 goal is is that these badges and the artifacts that people produce related to them are, are something that they're able to keep. Uh, for a longer term, I mean, unless you're very dedicated, you know, the the pieces of of paper and and documents and things like that, librarians tend not to think about carrying a a, a design portfolio with them from position to position. It tends to be you've created stuff, you leave it at the, the that organization you worked at, and then you go somewhere else. And so, by having these badges and the assorted artifacts um, accessible to you. In different ways, you'd be able to to more firmly back up that narrative, um, and you would also really be able to um, even go back and and re-earn those badges as the curriculum gets updated and the the competencies change, or well, not the competencies change, but the the pieces of those competencies change. So that way, uh, you're you're still on top of the skill set that you're you're looking for, 
Um, you're adapting to new technologies. Um, you're able to to recognize the shifting needs of your community and things like that, which are some things that libraries traditionally take a little bit longer uh, in order to get on board with. Mm -hmm. Gail, you've been listening. Do you want to help us figure out where we are? <laughs> or just what are you thinking now? Well, uh, you're still, there I, you I, I, yeah, I came, I came into the conversation um, with my digital ID hat on, and that's you know, a totally separate, um, well, kind of separate from my actual job. So because so it's a website that focuses on you know, digital citizenship issues. But in hearing this conversation, you know, I'm totally intrigued. I have to say, in my district, our librarians are amazing. So you know, one of the things I want to do tomorrow is send out a link and and um, you know tell them and, and get a conversation going with them, and then um, the PBS program is completely new to me too. So um, you know, I came in with one ear, but I'm now listening to my actual district <laughs> job. <laughs> so again, I'm a total uh, you know I'm a newbie. Although Paul, I did just earn badges on P2, PU, so for, for completing your course, so. Yeah. so thanks. I, I mean, and, and one of the things you just emphasized there is that badges help us value, you know, work people are doing, and that, that's important, mm -hmm. too. Um, cool. so, Nate and Christine, let's give you guys the last uh, few minutes here. Um, what did we hit here tonight, and what else? Do you think is brewing around all these these questions? Sure. Well, you know, I'll, I'll jump on that first. I, I do think a lot is brewing around questions of value in badge systems, and you know, there are a lot of different stakeholders to a badge system. And you know, one that we've been talking about tonight mostly is what the earner thinks. Um, but you know, what the issuer thinks is valuable is also important. What the potential employer or, or consumer of the badge thinks is valuable, and then just you know, we've been hearing a lot in the, the badge sort of blogosphere about just what people, you know, what the general public thinks of badges in general and what the value of these as alternative credentials is. And, you know, a lot of these different perspectives on value are related and a lot of, you know, questions come up. I think it was good of us to sort of try and tackle this one perspective sort of separate from the others and you know, figure out how the um, the different design decisions in a system affect that particularly. And so, you know, I thank you for inviting us to the conversation. And um, Christine, do you have any um, follow-up thoughts? Sure. Thanks. This was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. And I just want to say that it really boils down to what the ultimate goal of the badge was. And this was something that Stacy Cruz also mentioned. Uh, in a previous interview is who is the ultimate audience of the badge and also just echoing what Nate said is we need to consider who we are showing these badges to and we need to consider how they would view them and why they should value them and really think along those lines in establishing the value of badges. So let's, uh, Stacy. anything else you'd like to add? Thank you, Kristen. Is it, oh, you're muted still, Stacy. Stacy, sorry you're about muted. that. I think we covered a, a lot of, of territory. Now, the things that we discussed, I think we we all experienced the same challenges across all of the programs and badge implementation. But I, I think we covered a lot of the potential solutions just in this conversation tonight. Well, I, I got to say, but not everybody has faced the challenges like you guys have so directly, though. So that's really helpful to the to the larger community. Thanks. And Chris, do you have any last thoughts? Um, just that having been involved with um, uh, with Barry Joseph and doing badge design um, within New York City and creating badges for teens and then going through and creating badges for librarians and you know being on the side of a badge earner, it's been a fascinating experience and I'm I'm just really excited to see how they can be used to change professional development for adults because um, I, with the enthusiasm 
that teens are approaching with badging with, I think that that bodes well for our next generation of, of continuing learners. So that's a, a good place to be. Cool. So thank you all. Um, we're going to kind of finish up um, on time here tonight. <laughs> uh, and and uh, the links to the, you, know, you can find, if you just uh, Google case study establishing the value of badges, Burners, you'll it'll show up. But what, what what particular website is that on, guys? That is on dpdproject.info, so Design Principles Documentation Project. And we will have many more case studies forthcoming. There's a few already up there, as well as detailed analyses of each of the badge systems that we studied, including um, the News Hour one and the Elsa one. I believe the Elsa one is already published. And there were others from your study who wanted to get on here with us and said, let us know next time you do this. So we will do this again, um, if you guys don't mind, and, and keep the conversation going. Thank you all. Um, we do want to say here at the end that uh, we broadcast here every Wednesday evening, uh, 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific time. And um, we broadcast over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network that was set up several years ago by uh, Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo. And um, thank you all for tonight's conversation. And talk to you again soon. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Good night, everybody.